take any training in terms of having to deal with, let's say, aggressive patients and stuff like that? No. So then how do you handle that? By the grace of God. Really? Yeah. We are nurses, we are trained in healing, we are not trained in combat. That is technically. Yeah. Right. We are being beaten a lot here. We are, we are getting a lot of injuries from TV here. Yo. A lot of injuries from TV. The state of mental health in Namibia is vulnerable, now more than ever. Having to adjust to living in a pandemic while experiencing the financial and social effects of that takes a toll on one's mental health. The Namibian recently visited the Vinduk Mental Health Care Center to take a look at how the space that is supposed to assist us maintain a stable mental health are doing themselves, considering the times we find ourselves in. Head of Psychology at the Vinduk Mental Health Care Center, Lydia Nangolo, tells us the indirect effects COVID-19 has on the mental health of the Namibian public. Young people, some of them will come here for, for grief therapy because a parent died. A parent died and then now and it's uh, because of Corona, she will come and blame herself here. Yeah, maybe if I didn't come up, I didn't go out or maybe it's me, or maybe it's a neighbor, or what. It's about self-blame, it's about guilt feelings, it's about anger as well. Nangolo further touches on how she has come across young patients who come to her for grief therapy because of losing a loved one to COVID-19. I lost this, I cannot do it anymore, you are helpless. You are helpless, you have tried and you have. You are helpless. So it caused depression because this person is, is unable to recover what she was supposed to have. And then the fear is more, I mean, anxiety is more of threat. I feel threatened by Corona, so to say. I feel threatened by Corona. I'm not comfortable anymore. I am fearful wherever I go. For it now to become a, 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 a anxiety diagnosis, it, the, whatever the person is presenting, it has to meet the criteria that we have in the DSM-5 today. We have a book, a diagnostic book that we use. So this person, if she or he meets the criteria of what we call anxiety and then we give that diagnosis or she meet the criteria of what we, what we call depression and then we give th that uh, according to the presenting problem that she comes in with. Occupational therapy is a use of assessment and intervention to develop, recover or maintain the meaningful activities and occupations of individuals, groups, or communities. Dr. Tanashe Mutambudzi is a licensed occupational therapist and tells us more about the profession and how it helps mental health patients eventually resume to the outside world. With mental health problems, it affects how you function. You have to do the things that you are required to do in terms of your roles, uh, your work, your self-care, all those kind of things. So I'm there to just assist clients to counteract the effects of mental health and help them uh, be able to engage in occupations. Um, so with the COVID pandemic, I think the biggest issue has been the continuation of treatment uh, because of the restrictions in movement and uh, with some ailments in mental health, they need continuous support. And with that being constrained, it actually uh, makes life difficult for patients. Um, then also the fact that during uh, the pandemic, uh, people's lives were controlled. There were things that you want to do in terms of your hobbies, in terms of your recreation, which is part of the occupations that you need to do to have a balanced lifestyle. So that was affected. And some people's roles in terms of school work was also affected. So that caused a lot of stress uh, into people's lives, which in a way exacerbated uh, mental health conditions. As part of their therapy, patients from the forensic section are exposed to different projects at the facility, including operating a car wash, a tuck shop, a laundry room, woodwork activities, as well as gardening. The patients are given financial incentives from the work done in the projects and have the option of saving up or sending their earnings back to their families. Social workers at the forensic section, Jennifer Lifasi and Salma Usiku, say their main role at the unit is to work with family members 
Their biggest challenge pre-COVID was family support, and it became even worse when the pandemic was accompanied. Patients that we are working with, they are not all from Bendok, but they are all from all over the regions, which makes it difficult. COVID makes it difficult for the family member to come and visit their family here. And uh, another challenge that we are facing is that now with COVID, we have patients that are here whereby we need to trace their family members. Because with some of our peri- uh, patients, their relative doesn't know where they are, of which we need to assist them in tracing their family. But we are now finding it difficult, even if you get hold of them and explain to them that their person is now based here, she is he or she is now here at Mendal Hospital. It is a challenge that family members are unable to come down to Vinduk and meet their person. No matter how much you will explain to them, they'll still come back to you and say, I need my family to come and visit you. But then this is not allowed. You see. So it's really a challenge. Visitation and toiletries, patients do not have anything. We had to cut the socks for the patients because we don't have anything. And sometimes you dig down, you dig deep down your pocket as a staff member just to buy and provide for the patient because you are seeing every day. You see, you know what is happening. A patient is bathing with only water. It's cold, no vaseline, no soap, no washing powder. So what do you do? It's you who's always best with the patient. Well, with all these challenges from family support, uh, COVID restrictions, toiletries, visitation, calling. Did you voice these challenges to your superiors exactly. and did they report back to you? Perhaps we spoke with you? Yeah, I can say it is known, it was reported, but uh, the answer is that with this COVID in place, they are still looking into it and we are still waiting for that response. But as we speak today, we are still sitting with the same outside. Uh, there was a time when literally there was nothing to offer to the patients. So we have to go back to the uh, management. Um, when I say management, the minister, the uh, executive director to inform them about uh, the challenges that we are now having, whereby there was no medication to give to the patients. So I think they found a solution where now they have to compound some of the medication locally and the, the patient was uh, then able to get um, the medication. And also the challenge was also um, the number of patients that are coming to the hospital. Uh, it was very difficult to contain only 50 because we sometimes got 200 when it is out, out, outpatient. Um, this is the only mental health unit. Apart from the private ones now, which no one can afford, our patients, the ones that really need us, the ones that really need help, can't afford private mental health care. You understand? So everyone that comes in from the regions, they are coming here and the pressure is too much on us.